Okay, I think you can start. What do you think? I'm ready. Okay. So, thank you. Once again, for accept our invitation. In the name of all students and research, it's a pleasure to have you here with us and in, for opening our course, international course. And um, as Beatrix worked at oh, your lab, I will invite her to, to introduce you for everyone here. Beatrice, please. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Beatrice Junqueira. I'm very pleased to present you the first lecture of our second edition of the international course Advanced in Microbacterium Research and Application. Our first speak, speaker will be Dr. Cresta Madigan. Dr. Cresta Madigan earned her PhD in Microbiology and Molecular Genetics at Harvard Medical School where she studied mycobacterium tuberculosis lipid chemistry. As a postdoctoral fellow, she developed the leprosy infection in the zebrafish model with Dr. Lalita Hamakrishnan at the University of Washington and in UCLA, the University of California in Los Angeles, in the lab of Alvaro Segasti, Robert Modling, and Stephen Mayo. She joined the molecular biology faculty at the University of California in 2018 as a principal investigator of the med lab. And also personally, I need to say that she's an awesome advisor, an awesome person, and I'm very honored to have been her student. <laughs> and if someone in the audience has any questions, write in the chat. And at the end of the lecture, I will forward to Dr. Cresta. So Dr. Cresta, you can start whatever, whenever you want. <laughs> Thank you so much, Beatrice. Um, it is such a pleasure to be giving this talk today. So um, as you may know, right, right now uh, in the US, we're having our election today for president. Um, and so all I'm doing today is watching CNN and fear and giving this talk. So this is by far the best part of my day, you guys. Um, so I think uh, Beatrice did a great job um, introducing me and, um, and my work. I did my um, PhD on mycobacterium tuberculosis, and uh, that was um, in Boston. I then moved to uh, University of Washington in Seattle to um, work with Lalita Ramakrishnan, who had developed a zebrafish model for mycobacterium tuberculosis infection. Um, and that model has really done a lot for the TB field. And my hope was that it could similarly um, advance our understanding of some of the early infection events with mycobacterium leprae, which of course is closely related to mycobacterium tuberculosis. Um, so I'm excited to share with you today um, the work I did as a postdoctoral fellow. Um, I will say that um, now that I have my own lab, half of my lab continues our leprosy research. Uh, and the other half of, half of my lab is working on other neurological infections, um, including, for example, uh, tuberculosis meningitis. But I only have time to talk about um, the leprosy project today. Um, so as Beatrice mentioned, this was developed in Lali Ramakrishnan's lab um, with help from Robert Modlin, Alvaro Sagasti, and Steve Smale um, at UCLA. And um, I was just talking to Beatrice that this is what it feels like in the United States right now, <laughs> especially if you're a scientist. Um, it's been a wild roller coaster um, uh, the past eight months. Hopefully it's nearly over, um, but I'm, I'm very excited to no longer be focused on politics, at least for the next hour. It's really great to be focused on um, this fascinating infection. So. Uh, to start my talk, I, I like to talk about what happened when Rome fell. So that happened around 500 years um, uh, after uh, AD, Anno Domini. And when Rome fell, the eastern half of the Roman Empire stayed together and became the Byzantine Empire. So this included much of Egypt, Turkey, Greece, Italy, um, parts of Spain and North Africa. Uh, and I'm talking about the Byzantine Empire, at least mentioning it here, because leprosy was rampant um, in the Byzantine Empire. And the Byzantines actually knew that it was a contagious disease. 
So to try to stop the spread of leprosy among the populations, uh, they, uh, people in the Byzantine Empire built leprosaria. So these were essentially very fancy leper colonies. Um, and patients had a wonderful life in the leprosaria. Everything was paid for by the government. And so everyone wanted to live there. So you can see this is an illustration from a medieval manuscript showing a group of leprosy patients at the leprosarium. So you can see that they have these characteristic red lesions on their skin, right? And uh, that is a hallmark of early um, M. leprae infection. As you can see from this modern patient, you can see he has the same red lesions on his skin. So the leprosaria in the Byzantine Empire became so popular that people started to fake the symptoms of leprosy in order to be admitted. So one of the things um, people would do is take an irritating substance like tar from a tree and rub it on their skin really hard to try to simulate these red lesions. Um, they were trying to simulate these lesions so that they would be admitted to the leprosaria and have access to the high quality of life that was being offered there. So the Byzantines, when they saw people were trying to fake the symptoms of leprosy, realized they needed to come up with a test that would determine if somebody um, had leprosy. And the test that they developed is still in use in some parts of the world today as part of the leprosy diagnosis. So this test is that the doctor takes a needle and he pricks the patient in their skin lesions. And if the patient can't feel the needle, then they know that that person has leprosy. Now, the reason that this test works is because leprosy is the only skin infection that causes this widespread demyelinating destruction of nerves within these red skin lesions. So we've known that leprosy causes nerve damage for over a thousand years. Uh, but we still don't fully understand how that happens. So um, as I mentioned, uh, leprosy is a mycobacterial infection of the skin and nerves. Of course, um, I don't need to introduce this concept to you all. We have many leprosy experts uh, in the audience today. But you'll notice that um, if you look at biopsies of these inflamed skin lesions, you'll see two things. One is um, a dense infiltration of macrophages into the skin. And sometimes these macrophages are heavily infected with the M. leprae bacteria, which you can see here and here in pink. The other thing you see in these skin lesions is um, a dense infiltration of macrophages sometimes into the nerves and destruction of those nerves. So here is a nerve biopsy from a leprosy patient um, stained with um, CD68 um, marker for macrophages. The staining was done by Rosani Tellis uh, at the Modelin Lab, another contribution of Brazilian scientists. Um, so you often see these macrophages that have invaded the nerve in um, leprosy biopsies uh, from the nerve. Now, of course, there's two forms of leprosy. This is not just one disease, it's a spectrum of diseases, right? And at the poles of the spectrum are tuberculoid leprosy and lepromatous leprosy. It's important to note that you see nerve injury in both types of patients, um, although the presentation of the disease looks different, right? So um, if you have tuberculoid leprosy, the, these lesions are uh, typically, they have few bacteria in them. They have a lot of lymphocytes though, and, uh, and of course we see nerve damage. Patients with lepromatous leprosy uh, typically have more bacteria within their skin lesions than in the tuberculoid form. Uh, they have fewer lymphocytes, and again, you see um, a lot of nerve damage. Now, it's, it's, I think it's possible that the nerve damage that occurs in these two forms of leprosy could be quite different. Um, and yet there's something about this infection that still causes nerve damage to happen in, in each type of, um, in each form of the infection. So this suggests that even though there's this difference in the adaptive immune response between tuberculoid and lepromatous, right? We have lots of lymphocytes in tuberculoid and few in lepromatous, that despite that, the nerve damage is still a universal feature of this infection. So as the nerve damage disseminates up the nerve trunk from the skin lesions in the skin where it originates, that's when patients can start to experience uh, the stigmatizing deformities that we all associate with leprosy. So skin ulceration, blindness, uh, and loss of digits. So if we wanna help these patients 
um, and avoid these kinds of deformities, then we really need a better understanding of how nerve damage occurs in um, M. leprae infection. And secondly, we need to understand um, why this bacteria is targeting the nerve, specifically what causes the neurotropism of this infection. So, um, if this, uh, there's one hypothesis that we wanted to investigate first, which is that the uh, loss of um, uh, skin sensation in the lesions that you see with M. leprae infection, is it simply due to um, a mycobacterial infection of the skin? So to try to address this in my own mind, the first thing I did was I turned to um, the existing literature on mycobacterial skin infections. And, and of course, uh, mycobacteria can infect uh, the skin, several different types of mycobacterial species. So mycobacterium tuberculosis can cause cutaneous tuberculosis, although this is not very common today, it certainly does occur. Um, and these are what the lesions look like in that disease. You see, it doesn't, it doesn't really look like leprosy. And importantly, in these patients, there's not the kind of nerve injury that we see in M. leprae infection. Mycobacterium marinum, this is a, a fish pathogen um, that we use in my lab for our tuberculosis model in zebrafish. It's a natural pathogen of fish and like M. tuberculosis, it's co-evolved with, um, with the zebrafish immune system. So M. tuberculosis co-evolved with the um, immune system of humans. And so this is sort of a, uh, a corollary in, in fish. Humans that are handling a lot of fish or seafood can occasionally get skin infections by Mycobacterium marinum, and they form these nodules, but there's no uh, nerve injury um, within these nodules. It really only is Mycobacterium leprae that causes um, these unusual um, red skin lesions that contain uh, damaged nerves. Um, and so it seems like there's something unusual about M. leprae specifically that's causing or contributing to the nerve injury. Um, and it's not just the presence of mycobacteria in the skin, right? However, it's been difficult to understand uh, what the mechanisms uh, of this nerve injury are and to really understand the neuropathogenesis of leprosy. And that's in part because of some of the unique aspects of the biology uh, of M. leprae. So first of all, M. leprae has undergone um, an extreme reductive evolution. So this is the large scale loss of gene function. Uh, this has happened in M. leprae and it's happened in a few other um, obligate human pathogens, including chlamydia and rickettsia. Um, and in M. leprae, a lot of the genes that have been inactivated are in metabolic pathways. Uh, so we believe the bacteria are primarily using host metabolism. Um, and in part because of that, it's very difficult to culture these bacteria outside of an intact animal um, because they, they need host metabolism, it seems, in order to, um, to cause disease um, and also to replicate. So M. leprae cannot be cultured outside of an intact animal, and that means we don't have a genetic system for these bacteria, which makes it difficult to understand gene function in M. leprae, right? Um, so our uh, existing animal models for leprosy, of course, are the armadillo and the foot pads of skid mice. These are immunocompromised mice. And the reason that we have um, really only these two um, infection models for M. leprae is that these bacteria require cool temperatures to replicate around 30 degrees. So about 30 degrees, that's the temperature of the human skin approximately. That's also the temperature of the mouse foot pad. And it's the core temperature of an armadillo because armadillos have a lower core temperature than mammals. Um, but of course, um, when I was doing this work, trying to think about how we could study the, um, uh, the neurobiology of this infection, I was in a zebrafish lab and zebrafish are housed at about 30 degrees, right? They have a, a cooler core temperature than mammals. And that was one of the things that led us to ask if we could potentially use the existing zebrafish model of uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis to teach us something about nerve injury in mycobacterium leprae infection. So um, when I began this project, the questions I wanted to answer um, were, first of all, is it possible to use zebrafish to, to understand um, early events in M. leprae pathogenesis? Then um, is it possible that M. leprae can also cause nerve damage in zebrafish in addition to uh, humans and armadillos? And finally, I wanted to know, I wanted to use some of the really great genetic and imaging tools in zebrafish to understand the mechanisms of this early nerve injury. 
So first, turning to development of the zebrafish model, uh, we got our M. leprae bacteria initially from the National Hansen's Disease Program in Louisiana. Uh, so many thanks to them for their, um, uh, for their very important contributions to this work. They grew the bacteria in the foot pads of skid mice for about six months and then harvested the bacteria uh, for us, purified them and stained them with a lipophilic dye, a fluorescent lipophilic dye called PKH. Uh, then they shipped those bacteria to us overnight in Seattle, and we injected them um, intraperitoneally into um, adult zebrafish to observe uh, survival and histological outcomes of infection in an adult zebrafish. So a couple things to remember are that just like any adult mammal, um, adult zebrafish, right, they're vertebrates, so they have an adaptive immune system, T cells, B cells, antigen presentation, all of the things you would associate with um, adaptive immunity in, in mouse, for example, or in human. And the bacteria before we use them for infection uh, were confirmed to be viable, viable by radio respiratory. Um, so uh, of course you can't do uh, colony forming units with M. leprae, so we look at um, incorporation of C14 acetate. So um, with our first experiments in, um, in adult zebrafish, um, we took animals, um, uh, we sacrificed animals from this experiment every few months and processed them as you would uh, with a human biopsy. So we stained them for um, H&E, which is here in pink, um, and compared them to human biopsies from leprosy patients. So after about um, a month or so, we began to see in zebrafish formation um, of these dense macrophage aggregates or granulomas, which is typical of um, uh, some forms of leprosy in humans. So here you can see a human leprosy biopsy. And with this black line, I've demarcated the area of the macrophages in this granuloma. Um, so you can see in zebrafish, um, they, they look quite similar in these M. leprae infected animals. However, there's fewer lymphocytes around the outside of the granuloma. So here in this human biopsy, there's a ton of lymphocytes around the outside, and that's quite typical. In zebrafish, we see fewer of those lymphocytes, although they are there. Um, one reason this could be is that, of course, this animal's only been infected for a month or so, whereas this human has probably been infected for much longer. Um, so they, the granulomas can't be directly compared, but histologically, they look quite similar. We also see if you stain these granulomas in fish, um, the presence of the bacteria, which are in this sort of purple or pink color, in macrophages. So you can see the macrophages in this granuloma are quite densely infected. And that is occasionally seen in human leprae as well, especially in the lepromatous form of the disease. Uh, something we did not see in the zebrafish that um, is also um, relevant for leprosy is necrosis. So um, remember that uh, granulomas caused by any mycobacterial infection, or at least um, specifically those by TB, uh, form these infected macrophages around a necrotic core. So um, what happens in TB granulomas is that the center of the granuloma undergoes necrosis and the bacteria begin to replicate extracellularly inside the caseum. Um, of this necrotic granuloma. And that's, um, uh, that's fairly diagnostic for tuberculosis, but it does not happen in human leprosy. Um, and it also doesn't happen in fish that are infected with M. leprae. So here's a fish infected with, um, with that, here's a granuloma and a fish infected with M. leprae down here. You can see that although the macrophages are heavily infected, there's no necrosis occurring here. Um, Whereas if you infect a fish with Mycobacterium marinum, which is this TB-like pathogen in fish, you do get a necrotic core. So you can see this very dense purple color and it's surrounded by these um, uh, macrophages, oh, excuse me, macrophages that have um, undergone an epithelial transformation to make this sort of very nice um, fibrotic cuff around the granuloma. Importantly, that doesn't happen with M. leprae, and we don't see that happening in zebrafish infected with M. leprae either. And so um, that suggests that at least these early responses to M. leprae um, in terms of adaptive and innate immunity are, are, can be similar between humans um, and uh, zebrafish infected with M. leprae. Now, there's a lot of cool experiments we can do in the adults, um, and we're getting ramped up for some of that. We can do live imaging in adult zebrafish. We can look at what lymphocytes are doing in a granuloma in a living animal, right? So um, 
we can uh, cause a granuloma to happen in the skin of the zebrafish or in um, uh, other areas of the zebrafish that are very superficial and easy to access for intravital imaging. Um, and of course, others have already developed um, tools to look at T cells, um, especially um, in blood cancers in zebrafish. So I'm excited to bring some of those adaptive immunity tools that have been developed in zebrafish and potentially use them to understand what adaptive immunity is doing in these granulomas. So that's some work on the horizon that I'm excited about. But of course, the reason that people are interested in the zebrafish model is not necessarily in working with the adult animals. People are excited about working with the larvae because they're so easy to genetically modify. So the next experiment I did uh, was to infect zebrafish larvae. So what are some advantages that zebrafish larvae offer um, if you want to know more about mycobacterial pathogenesis? Well, this is a, a two-day-old zebrafish larvae. Uh, so they are um, laid externally from the parent and they develop externally. So you can watch the entire process um, of development from a single cell up to an animal that can swim and hunt and school and, um, and those kinds of complex adult behaviors. So when the, by the time the fish is two days old, it already has all components of the human innate immune system, macrophages, neutrophils, dendritic cells, um, uh, complements all of the features of, of um, human innate immunity. It also has, by two days old, a beating heart, a recognizable brain, um, and many other features of the nervous system um, that you would need to understand neurological infection in a vertebrate. Because these animals are so similar to humans, they share uh, about 70% of, um, of their genes with humans. So there's homologs for about 70% of human genes present in the zebrafish. And of course, genetic manipulation of the fish is quite easy. It, it's much more similar to what you would do in bacteria than what you need to do in, for example, a mouse. So we can knock out genes overnight. Uh, CRISPR works very well in zebrafish. You can even, you can knock out, um, people have shown up to 20 genes at a time uh, with a single injection in the zebrafish. Um, we can inhibit translation using morpholinos. And of course, there's many transgenic and reporter lines that already is, exist, especially in neuroscience. Because these animals are completely optically transparent, so you can see right through them like they're glass. That means we can do really nice intravital imaging at any location within the nervous system of this animal. We can also use that to watch um, infection or at least the early events. And most importantly, uh, this is already an established model for um, TB pathogenesis using the fish pathogen Mycobacterium marinum. And that was important for me because of course we lack a genetic system with M. leprae, but I was wondering, is it possible to express M. leprae genes within Mycobacterium marinum so that we can at least study the function of individual M. leprae genes during infection. So the first experiment I did with the larvae was to infect them with fluorescent um, M. leprae. And we saw in zebrafish um, that recruitment of macrophages to M. leprae is dependent on CCL2. So this is a chemokine that's important for recruiting um, uh, monocytes and macrophages. And we already knew that with Mycobacterium marinum, remember this is our model TB pathogen, that CCL2, um, the presence of the CCL2 receptor was required for macrophage recruitment. So you can see these are fish that either are wild type, so they still have the receptor, or morpholino, so they lack the receptor. You can see when you get rid of CCL2, macrophages are not recruited to M. marinum. And we saw exactly the same thing happening with M. leprae. If anything, there was even more robust recruitment in the CCL2 wild type animals. Uh, so that's good and suggests that some of these early events that cause recruitment of macrophages to mycobacteria are similar between um, M. marinum and M. leprae in the zebrafish. The other thing we saw that's quite similar to how zebrafish respond to M. marinum uh, is the formation of granulomas in the larvae. So to um, assay granuloma formation in larvae, we use these transgenic animals that express fluorescent genes from all their myeloid cells. So here's an example of what these granulomas look like when we infect with M. marinum, which you can see in blue here. So um, we knew that this process was happening with M. marinum when I injected M. leprae, which is labeled here in green. 
we again saw in the larvae formation of these granulomas, but you can see they look a bit different, right, than the marinum granulomas. Um, and I still don't know why that is, um, but I have to suspect it, it has something to do with these early interactions um, between um, the bacteria and the cells that cause them to undergo necrosis. So we know that happens with M. marinum, and we know it doesn't happen with M. leprae. And so I'm wondering if maybe the, the different structure of these M. leprae granulomas could have something to do with the absence of that necrotic pathway. So um, we uh, started looking at what are the function of these granulomas um, in terms of the ability of the fish to control M. leprae infection. Um, so we wanted to know if the macrophages in the granulomas specifically were important for control of infection. So the first experiment we did um, was we injected uh, zebrafish larvae that were either wild type or where we had depleted their macrophages. And so we can do this in several ways in zebrafish. Um, here I use the PU1 morpholino, but we can also do this with CRISPR mutants um, using actually the exact same technique. We just inject into the eggs when the, um, when the eggs are a single cell and then allow those eggs to develop into a larva and that larva will lack the genes that we're interested in. Um, we can also do this using um, a couple of different chemical approaches. And when we did all of those different approaches, they all gave us the same answer, which is that macrophages are required for control of these bacteria within fish. So here we see, um, this is a, the y-axis tells you the number of M. leprae that are present in the animal um, by fluorescent pixel count. Um, and you can see that if we get rid of macrophages in these animals here, there's more bacterial fluorescence, suggesting that if you don't have macrophages, then you are not able to uh, control the infection. However, um, you know, the role of the macrophage in both tuberculosis and in leprosy is quite complex. They're not just doing one thing, right? Um, so we wanted to see if some of the other functions that have been attributed to macrophages in terms of control of marinum or tuberculosis, if macrophages could be playing those same roles with M. leprae in the fish. So one of the things we looked at was dissemination. Uh, so for this experiment, I infected zebrafish that, had, uh, that were transgenic so that they had labeled endothelial cells. So what you're looking at here, these are blood vessels running through um, myotomes in the zebrafish. So these are muscles that they're supplying. The blood vessels you can see are in red and I injected green fluorescent mycobacteria. Now, if I did this in a wild type animal, all of the green bacteria stay on the inside of these blood vessels. So they're retained in circulation where I injected them. But if I did this experiment in a wild type um, animal that lacks macro, or excuse me, if I did this experiment um, in a wild type animal, green bacteria were taken up from inside the vessels and then they began to leave. So you can see an example of one of those um, cells packed with green bacteria here that has exited the circulation. And uh, this only happens if it's done in a wild type animal. If I do it in a uh, macrophage depleted animal, we don't see these cells containing bacteria escaping from circulation. So that uh, suggests that macrophages or monocytes are involved in dissemination within uh, the zebrafish. And so um, with M. leprae, that, that fits nicely with clinical data. Um, as you probably know, there have been these reports going back to the 1970s, for example, in this New England Journal of Medicine paper, showing that leprosy patients can have a really huge number of um, leprae bacteria in their circulation. And these, this is a transient event, it's not constant, but it seems to happen especially in Lepromatous patients. And the bacteria that the, um, the cells of these bacteria are inside of really look very similar to monocytes or at least a myeloid cell, although these cells were never identified in these, these early papers. And so, um, uh, you know, leprosy patients can have up to a thousand of these infected cells um, per milliliter of blood. Um, and I'll come back to this point later when we discuss um, the mechanism that we've uncovered because we believe um, that these myeloid cells are playing a very important role in the, the neuropathogenesis of this disease. So um, at this point, uh, you know, we felt comfortable that the zebrafish model was going to prove to be um, a, a useful model for understanding at least some of these early um, interactions between the bacteria and the innate immune system of zebrafish. So we'd seen in adult granulomas that did not undergo necrosis. Um, that's something that's also seen in humans infected with M. leprae. 
In the larvae, we saw that um, macrophages are required to control infection. Uh, they seem to be required for dissemination. And they're also performing this role of forming granulomas to um, potentially you know, wall off the infection from the rest of the organism, right? Um, but these are all innate immune features of the infection. Of course, I was really interested in the neuropathogenesis because that to me seems like this um, very important but not fully understood area of this disease. So of course, I was really interested in understanding um, how does the nervous system of zebrafish um, respond to M. leprae infection? Um, and you may know that zebrafish are a very popular tool um, in, um, in some areas of neuroscience. And this is because of the things I've already told you about. They're transparent, right? So you can see through them. There's been um, really amazing imaging uh, approaches applied to zebrafish larvae, intravital imaging. So you can watch things like action potentials shooting down a neuron or an axon. Um, and then of course, the really great genetics um, uh, in the zebrafish model where you can knock out or put in new genes quite easily. Um, so, I was wondering if we could use some of these fantastic neurobiology tools to try to understand um, how nerves respond to infection with M. leprae. So if you're interested in understanding nerve damage in, um, uh, in response to M. leprae, there's, um, there's, this, there's a model that's been published over the past 20 years in some, in some really beautiful and paradigm shifting papers um, that describes how M. leprae interact with Schwann cells. So Schwann cells are these uh, specialized myelinating glia of the peripheral nervous system. Uh, they generate myelin uh, that they wrap around individual axons. And in this model of, M. Leper of how M. leprae damages nerves that's, that's been published, uh, what they found is that in order for nerve damage to occur, or at least what they propose to be happening is that in order for nerve damage to occur in response to M. leprae, the bacteria have to infect myelinating glia and they have to express a lipid called PGL1, which I'll talk more about in a moment. This lipid interacts with alpha dystroglycan and, um, and um, laminin alpha 2 on Schwann cells and causes those cells to de differentiate um, and presumably leaving the axons then unmyelinated. And uh, the hypothesis is that. It's this process that leads to nerve injury in um, M. leprae infection. And most of this work, uh, at least the vast majority of it has been performed using um, Schwann cells in culture. These are typically Schwannoma cells. Um, so I wanted to know about how this might be working in an animal, in zebrafish. And there is quite a lot of clinical data um, from leprosy that suggests that um, there may be additional mechanisms in addition to the Schwann cell infection model um, that could explain how nerve damage occurs in humans and, and potentially in zebrafish also. So some of the unexplained data from, um, from humans that, um, that is difficult to understand in context of this existing model is that we see non-myelinated um, nerves being damaged in, um, in leprosy patients. Schwann cell infection um, often is seen in leprosy patients, but sometimes it's not. And of course, the nerve damage is always there. Also, myelinating Schwann cells are not observed to be infected in, um, in leprosy patient biopsies. We typically see infection of the non-myelinating uh, Schwann cells. And so that begs the question of how myelinating Schwann cells might be infected. And finally, there's this question of, of how does M. leprae get into the nerve in the first place, right? These are bacteria that cannot move on their own. They're not modal. Um, and we know that they're present heavily in the blood in the circulation of leprosy patients, but how they move from the circulation into the nerve, that's unknown. Um, and so I wanted to investigate how, um, how we might explain some of this clinical data in the context of an infected intact organism rather than, um, rather than an in vitro study. So to try to understand how nerve damage might be occurring in response to M. leprae in an intact animal, um, we looked to this zebrafish transgenic called um, MBP or myelin basic protein. And the first place you start to see um, uh, fluorescent myelin being deposited in these fish is in these tracts of myelinated nerves along the spinal cord. And so this is the central ner nervous system, not the peripheral nervous system. However, we thought this would be a reasonable place to begin our studies because we know that all of the determinants of M. leprae infection of Schwann cells are shared by um, the myelinating glia of the, of the central nervous system. 
So our first experiments, we injected M. leprae into these tracks of myelinated axons. And we saw within a few days, uh, the formation of these strange myelin rings surrounding the fluorescent bacteria, only where the fluorescent bacteria were closely associated with those myelinated axons. So to make sure that this wasn't just due to um, the injection, for example, we always ran controls where we injected saline or PBS into the same tract of axons. Um, and we never observed these, these sort of rings of myelin when we did that. So you can see that they start forming at two days, these rings of myelin, um, but they become much more pronounced by four days post-infection. So of course, um, my first guess about what was happening here was, well, maybe this is something um, about the mycobacterial infection of the nerves that's, that's causing these strange myelin rings to form. Um, so I wanted to take a, um, a better look at how the rings, these myelin rings were actually forming. Um, so I took a movie and hopefully you guys will be able to see this. Um, on top, you're seeing um, a myelinated axon in, injected with mycobacteria and you see the rings forming where the arrows point out. On the bottom is another nerve injected with PBS. Um, and they're both imaged over 12 hours. And so you can see hopefully from, from these movies that the myelin rings seem to form from the myelin that had been around the axons, right? It seems like it's kind of retracting into a blob. Um, so in order to figure out what was causing the formation of these rings, I wanted to do a control for mycobacterial infection. So what I did is I injected the myelinated tracts of axons with mycobacterium marinum. Remember, this is our model TB pathogen, but this pathogen does not cause nerve injury in humans. It doesn't cause nerve in injury in zebrafish or in any other system um, where it's been examined. And of course, when I injected it into the myelinated tracts of axons and zebrafish larvae, I didn't see the formation of these, of these strange rings that we saw with M. leprae. Um, and so that suggested that it was something specific about M. leprae, rather than just the presence of a mycobacterial infection, that was causing the presence of, of these myelin rings. So what is that difference between marinum and M. leprae? Well, there's certainly lots of things that are different, um, but one of the most famous differences between marinum and M. leprae is this lipid called PGL1 or phenolic uh, glycolipid 1. So uh, this is a, a quite famous lipid in the leprosy field, right? It's only synthesized by Mycobacterium leprae. It's an outer membrane lipid on mycobacteria. So it's probably one of the first things the macrophage contacts when it detects these bacteria in zebrafish or, or in mammals. And we also know that PGL1 is very important for causing um, upregulation um, and recruitment of monocytes um, via CCL2, that chemokine that I told you about in the beginning. So um, there's many, um, many bits of um, circumstantial uh, data suggesting that PGL1 may be um, involved in, in nerve injury in, uh, in M. leprae. So here's the structure of phenolic glycolipid 1. You can see it has this elaborate lipid backbone. Um, and this was, this was satisfying for me because I did my PhD on, um, on mycobacterial lipids. So it was sort of nice for me to be working on a lipid again a little bit as a postdoc. So you can see that with PGL1, we have this um, trisaccharide on the phenol ring um, that's um, methylated. And this trisaccharide is supposed to be the, um, the cause of all of the biological activity of phenolic glycolipid 1. And, this, and the trisaccharide itself is unique to M. leprae. So other mycobacteria make the lipid backbone, but only M. leprae makes this unique methylated trisaccharide. Now, Mycobacterium marinum, our model TB pathogen, is very closely related to M. leprae, and it makes a version of PGL1, except its PGL1 only is a monosaccharide, so it lacks the other two sugars. So, of course, if we wanted to know how does this trisaccharide contribute to um, the formation of this myelin disruption in zebrafish, the obvious experiment um, would be to knock out um, PGL1, right, from, um, from M. leprae. But of course, we don't have a genetic system in M. leprae, so we can't do that experiment. So um, the experiment that I, um, that I ended up doing is sort of the inverse of the experiment we wanted to do. Um, what I did is I took the, the PGL1 genes from M. leprae, 
and I put them into M. marinum, which of course does not cause the myelin disruptions in fish. And that allowed us to generate this strain, M. marinum PGL1, which now produced the trisaccharide um, phenolic glycolipid of M. lepri, but it's being produced by M. marinum. So that will allow us, that's a, a knock-in strategy, right? That will allow us to test the requirement of PGL1 to nerve injury. And um, I mentioned that I, I did my PhD in uh, um, um, mycobacterial lipids. So I, I called him up, my PhD advisor, Branch Moody, and I got him involved in my research yet again. Uh, he, uh, he and his lab were able to do um, tandem mass spec on this lipid that was being produced by Marinum and uh, use, uh, use how, the fra how the fragments of this uh, lipid were generated within the mass spec in order to prove that in fact, Marinum was making this trisaccharide. And we can see that um, by this fragment 525 right here, which is only produced um, in the recombinant strain and is not produced by wild type M. marinum that lacks the M. lepri genes. Okay, so now we knew that we had our lipid being produced. I went back to the zebrafish now with this recombinant strain, injected it into the same tract of myelinated axons, and I saw again the formation of these myelin disruptions. Um, there were fewer of them than what I saw with M. lepri, but they were still there. Um, and of course they're not there um, with the wild type strain. And so this suggests that um, PGL1 from M. lepri is required for the formation of these myelin disruptions that I was seeing by confocal imaging. Um, but of course the gold standard for understanding um, myelin disruption in any animal model is um, electron microscopy, right? So I developed a method uh, with a very talented electron microscopist at UCLA to take thin sections right through these lesions in, in the axon so that we could see what was happening with the myelin and with the axon. So what we saw um, is, I'm showing you an example here in these two images. I've highlighted the myelinated axons in pink. So you can see that there's fewer of them in this animal that was infected with M. lepri control, uh, compared to an animal that was injected at the same site with a PBS or saline. So here's the number of axons, control animal, here's animal infected with M. lepri, and here's an animal infected with marinum PGL1. So we see the same phenotype, maybe even a more extreme one in the, um, in the uh, PGL1 expressing recombinant animal. However, the total number of axons did not change in these animals, uh, whether they got PBS or mycobacteria, it's the same number of axons. Only the number of myelinated axons went down. Um, so that was fantastic, and this suggests that demyelination occurs in the fish in response to M. lepri um, or in response to recombinant bacteria that express PGL1. So that was very satisfying. Um, we used this technique to take a closer look at what was happening to the ultrastructure of the myelin um, during infection. So what you're looking at here is the Mothner axon in zebrafish. This is the largest axon these animals have at, at the age where we injected them. Um, and this is at the, um, the most dense myelin in the animal is around this one particular axon. And what we saw in zebrafish is that in the in infected animals, this nice, dense, tightly packed myelin began to sort of separate out or dissociate from the axons. Um, this, is a, this is in humans, this is referred to as myelin decompaction. And it's a early stage of demyelination that is seen again in humans infected with M. lepri. So this is a um, electron micrograph from a paper published in 1973 showing that uh, the lamellae of the myelin are beginning to pull apart from the axon. And so that looks quite similar to what we see in zebrafish. So um, what we'd seen so far looking at nerve damage in response to M. lepri is that M. lepri infection of myelinated um, axons in zebrafish causes myelin decompaction and then myelin loss. And that those rings of myelin that I was seeing um, seem to be associated with myelin retracting from the axons. We had also seen, because of our work with M. marinum, that phenolic glycolipid one, specifically the sugar of that molecule, is required for demyelination in animal in, um, in zebrafish. Um, so, of course, this is very interesting and satisfying, but I was really curious about what's the mechanism of this nerve injury, right? Um, because we had this very nice paradigm that had already been set up by um, these previous papers that implicates the importance of M. lepri getting into these Schwann cells, right? So this whole model is predicated upon the idea that M. lepri infects myelinating Schwann cells. 
Um, and, you know, we wanted to see if that was happening in the zebrafish as well. So there were several things that were different from um, in the zebrafish than are suggested by this in vitro model of Schwann cell infection. So for example, one of the things we saw was that non-myelinated axons in zebrafish um, were being affected uh, as they are in, in human leprosy. So what we saw was swelling of axons. So here we see um, um, these are non-myelinated axons that I've highlighted in orange in an animal that was injected with PDS. Here we see an animal injected with M. leprae, and here's an animal injected with um, marinum PG expressing PGL1. And hopefully what you could see is that the size of the axons actually increases in the infected animals compared to the PBS injected animals. Um, but we never saw the bacteria within myelinating clea. They were always sitting next to them um, or inside another cell type, which I'll discuss in a moment. But these swollen axons um, had something within them, not the bacteria. What they had inside of them were swollen mitochondria. Uh, so I'm showing you two different ways we assess that here. Um, on the top, these three top panels, these are, um, uh, you're looking at the number of mitochondria. So every time there's a mitochondrion, I've highlighted it for you in purple. So you can see with these top panels, the number of mitochondria is decreased in the infected animal compared to the PBS injected one. And also, the mitochondria are larger in um, these infected animals. So here in purple, this is the outline of a mitochondrion in an M. leprae infected fish. You can see that in a PBS infected fish, the area of the mitochondrion is smaller. Um, and that's, um, that's something that I think I've got it coming up in a few slides here that um, has also been shown in humans. Um, we also showed that um, in zebrafish, this loss of mitochondria happens where demyelination is happening. Um, so what you're looking at here in this diagram is a, a tract of myelinated axons along the top of the spinal cord of the zebrafish. Then you have all these unmyelinated axons, which have a lot of mitochondria, and then another group of myelinated axons. So what you see in this area in the same fish um, that's undergoing infection and demyelination in response to M. leprae. You see all of these myelin rings forming, right, as I showed you before, but you also see swelling of mitochondria and then a decrease in the number, right? So that matches up very well with what we saw by electron microscopy. And as I mentioned, this has been shown in 2016 to occur in leprosy biopsies from human patients. So here we have um, this is not my own work. This is um, uh, work that comes out of uh, Fiocruz. So here we have the control um, nerve biopsies. These are from patients with other kinds of neuropathy and leprosy patient biopsies. You can see that the area of the mitochondria increases in humans as it does in fish. And so that was something that was really satisfying to me because I, I had this mitochondrial finding before this paper came out in 2016. And until this paper came out, I had no idea how to interpret um, this finding that I had of increased mitochondrial size. Um, and so when this paper came out in humans, I was like, yes, finally. <laughs> I'm, now I'm, I'm finding some, some agreement with, the, uh, with what's seen in humans. So that was very satisfying. Uh, so this is a movie um, showing you where the, um, where the bacteria in red are located in terms of the myelin protrusions. As you can see here, the bacteria are not inside of the myelin protrusions, right? And that's what I thought I was gonna find. I thought I was gonna find bacteria within the protrusions um, because I, I thought this was probably evidence of um, glial infection, but in fact, it wasn't. Um, we didn't see the bacteria ever inside of the myelinating protrusions. The place that we saw them was in this cell here. Um, so this is just one example of it. So you can see here, um, the leprae bacteria are in cross section. I've labeled them with L's. They're inside of these electron lucent compartments inside of this electron dense cell. Um, and so what this is, it's a phagocyte, or at least it appears to be um, by electron microscopy. So this suggests that potentially M. leprae infected phagocytes are playing an important role in the nerve of these, um, of these fish that are undergoing demyelination. So the next thing I did was take a time-lapse movie. Um, I'll start playing it now while I describe to you what you're seeing. This is um, the, a zebrafish nerve uh, that's been injected with blue fluorescent M. leprae. And this is a transgenic animal. So it has green myelin, which you can see there. Um, they look like long pieces of spaghetti. Those are axons wrapped in myelin. And then the red cells are macrophages. 
And uh, what I wanted to do with this experiment, this is a 12 hour time lapse um, starting right after I injected the animal. I wanted to see how the macrophages responded to M. leprae in the context of a nerve infection. Um, and so what we saw here, and, and we saw this every time, is that the macrophages are the cells that take up the leprae first, um, rather than any kind of neuroglia. It's the macrophages that first respond to leprae. And after they have phagocytosed all of the M. leprae, the most heavily infected cells start um, grouping together in what is actually a nascent granuloma. So if you look at this fish uh, several days later at this site, what you'll see is a bunch of infected macrophages hanging out together in a conglomerate or an, or an early granuloma. Um, we also confirmed this with electron microscopy. So now we had seen that the macrophages were important for um, this early response to um, M. leprae infection in zebrafish. So what we saw here, if we knocked out the macrophages from the zebrafish and then injected them with M. leprae, is that there wasn't nearly as much demyelination in these animals lacking macrophages. Um, and we saw in the animals that were still wild type, these um, uh, granulomas forming in the nerves. So here, this fish has um, macrophages labeled in red and the M. leprae are in green. Um, so that suggests that macrophages are required for this early form of myelin disruption that we were seeing in the zebrafish. So this is the model that we were left with at this point. We know that these macrophages become infected with M. leprae and that somehow there's a response to phenolic glycolipid 1 that results in um, myelin loss and in potentially in the swelling of in the um, mitochondria within axons near where infected macrophages are responding to M. leprae. And because we had this finding that there was um, something important about phenolic glycolipid 1, this suggested to us a model wherein the phenolic glycolipid one is inducing some kind of response in the macrophages that causes the macrophages to induce this nerve injury. And, and this was our model because we knew that the macrophages were required for nerve injury and we knew that phenolic glycolipid one was required. You have to have both of them. So we, we did try injecting um, just purified PGL1 and we didn't see any demyelination. So we know that there's a requirement for both PGL1 and the macrophage. Um, to cause this demyelination. So I next went in vitro to try to understand what that factor was that was being induced by PGL1. I treated mouse macrophages with purified lipid. I also infected them with wild type marinum versus marinum um, expressing PGL1. And in both cases, we saw this massive upregulation of inducible nitric oxide synthase or INOS. I then went back into the fish and zebrafish that were injected in the spinal cord with either marinum or PGL1. We saw a big increase in INOS positive cells that were expressing um, in, in fish that expressed, or in marinum that expressed PGL1, suggesting that this upregulation of INOS is in response to PGL1 and is maintained in the zebrafish. So here you can see in the spinal cord in these myelinated um, tracts of axons and zebrafish, couple macrophages. This one here is infected, this one is not. You can see that it's only the infected macrophages that cause this upregulation of INOS um, in neurological tissue. And in fact, this is, this is not a new finding. This has been published before in human nerve biopsies. In fact, this is the same antibody that I used in the fish. Many of um, the cells present in this um, leprosy patient nerve biopsy are expressing a high level of INOS, suggesting that this finding we had in zebrafish probably occurs in humans too. Of course, it's great that we're seeing this INOS upregulation, right? But is this important for demyelination? So to test this, uh, the first thing I used was either inhibitors of nitric oxide or donors. So these are chemicals that will prevent um, nitric oxide or induce it. When I infected with M. leprae and compared um, fish that were untreated with these inhibitors compared to fish that were treated, I saw a decrease in demyelination. Conversely, when I treated with nitric oxide donors, I saw an increase in demyelination in these animals, suggesting that yes, I, a nitric oxide is playing an important role in demyelination. When there's less of it, demyelination goes down. When there's more of it, demyelination goes up. And so that left us with this model of how inflammation may be contributing to demyelination in response to M. leprae infection in zebrafish. We have a heavily infected macrophage. Um, it becomes infected because it's responding to M. leprae present in the nerve. 
when the macrophage um, becomes infected, at least the most heavily infected ones, they stop moving. As you could see in that nerve infection, the macrophages are zooming all over the place, right? They don't stay static except for the ones that are very heavily infected and that are starting to form that nascent granuloma. So those are the cells that come to rest next to axons because they're, they're present in the nerve. They respond to phenolic glycolipid one by upregulating inducible nitric oxide synthase. That results in, um, uh, in synthesis of nitric oxide, which is a gas, right? And so that can diffuse outside of the macrophage and into whatever other cells are present near this nascent granuloma. And so of course, in the nervous system, you're going to have myelinated axons and also unmyelinated ones near these heavily infected macrophages. Mitochondria are very susceptible to oxidative damage. And we think this could be one way that nitric oxide produced by macrophages is damaging axon mitochondria. So th these findings were significant um, because this was the first time that we had an association of innate immunity contributing to demyelination in response to M. leprae infection. So moving on from this, um, my lab is very interested in understanding more about how the macrophages respond to M. leprae in the context of a neurological infection, and then how the axons and the myelinating glia themselves um, are responding uh, to nerve injury potentially stimulated by the macrophages, right? Um, so we wanna know about how macrophages are responding to phenolic glycolipid one, both in M. leprae infection and in TB because TB makes a form of PGL1 that is also a trisaccharide. It's the only other mycobacterial pathogen of humans that makes this trisaccharide PGL1. And then we wanna know more about how uh, nitric oxide stress is potentially causing nerve injury, both to myelin and to the mitochondria within axons. Um, so I wanna tell you a little bit about where we're going with this data. So I have unpublished data um, showing that in order for macrophages to respond to PGL1, uh, they must produce sting. So sting is this cytosolic sensor, um, primarily of viral infections. Um, and we know that in um, mouse macrophages in vitro, if we don't have sting or if we don't have sea gas, um, that this INOS pathway does not occur. So this is um, quite, um, I think quite interesting because it's, it implicates um, a role for sting in M. leprae infection to respond to this um, uh, methylated trisaccharide of PGL1. And of course we know that uh, one of the things that happens when sting gets induced is upregulation of interferon beta. Interferon beta has shown to be um, in work from the Modelin lab and from uh, others at Biocruz has been shown to be important for survival of mycobacteria within macrophages. And so this could potentially be one mechanism by which PGL1 is both promoting survival of the bacteria and potentially stimulating nerve damage. So some of the things we'd like to investigate um, in this model is how, do, um, how does sting respond to PGL1? Um, how does it in, um, uh, detect the presence of this lipid? Is it through direct interaction or through a receptor? Um, and then I also wanna test the role of PGL1 in um, um, potentially in hypervirulent uh, strains of TB. So is the same pathway being induced by the PGL1 that, that TB synthesizes? Um, I also want to know more about how upregulation of inducible nitric oxide synthase contributes to demyelination. We've got two pathways that could be occurring here, right? One of them is um, direct injury of the, of the mitochondria within axons by nitric oxide that's produced by macrophages. But the other pathway could be direct injury to myelin. So myelin is of course a lipid. Lipids can undergo oxidation in response to reactive oxygen and nitrogen species. So we wanna look at how those two pathways potentially interact with each other. Um, one of the things we also saw in these axons that had damaged mitochondria is that the, the mitochondria um, were missing or were sort of clumped together, which suggests that there's potentially a problem with um, axonal transport of mitochondria, right? So um, as, as you all are probably very well aware, mitochondria are transported along axons um, by microtubules, which is an ATP dependent process. And then finally, um, I wanted to know more about how um, macrophages um, might be uh, interacting um, with nerves in ways that, uh, that cause their, their disruption. 
Um, so we can do this by um, in zebrafish by um, depleting macrophages, but we can also deplete components of the nervous system genetically. So we can, for example, remove all of the myelinating cells in zebrafish, and the, these animals are viable, at least as larvae. Um, and so then we can specifically test the contribution of demyelination separate from axon mitochondrial injury. So to conclude, uh, today I told you about my work modeling M. leprae infection in zebrafish, which revealed that nitric oxide produced by macrophages is required for early nerve injury in response to M. leprae, and this occurs even before myelinating glia have become infected. So in the lepromatous form of this disease, you can imagine that these macrophages um, may die and release um, all of these components of M. leprae into the endoneurium. And now that the M. leprae are in the endoneurium, now they're in a place where they can be taken up by Schwann cells. And so potentially that's one way to connect this mechanism to the established mechanism of M. leprae infection of Schwann cells leading to demyelination. In the tuberculoid form of this disease of leprosy, you can imagine though that um, uh, the, that lymphocytes may become involved in response to all of this nitric oxide, potentially via the interferon gamma axis, and that this might contribute to both killing of the bacteria and even to increase neurotoxicity, because um, we know that um, activated T cells can also produce a lot of neurotoxic um, uh, molecular features, right? So um, this, may, this may explain why both forms of leprosy are associated with nerve injury. And one of the most exciting things I think from this work is that we found a role for, um, uh, for macrophage produ production of nitric oxide. And uh, this pathway has specifically been implicated in other demyelinating diseases. So for example, it's been implicated in multiple sclerosis, which occurs in the central nervous system, but it's also been implicated in demyelination in Guillain-Barre um, Guillain syndrome, which is a post-viral demyelinating neuropathy that occurs in the peripheral nervous system. And so, in fact, I think what we're learning about this model from neurodegeneration in, in leprosy is that perhaps it's not so different from other kinds of demyelination, right? Um, and that potentially there are more similarities between leprosy and their demyelinating neurodegenerative conditions than we previously appreciated. So um, that's all for my talk. I just want to quickly thank um, everyone who contributed to this work in my postdocs, so the Ramakrishnan Lab, the Sagasti Lab, the Maudlin Lab, and Steve Smale and his team. Um, my funding sources for, um, for the first part of this work were through um, the NIH and the um, AP Giannini Foundation. And in my own lab at UCSD, I'm very happy to say that our work has been well received and is now funded by um, the Searle Scholars Program and the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. Um, and we have these beautiful new digs in Tata Hall. I, I miss it very much. I haven't been there in a few months, but um, Beatrice can hopefully tell you about how much fun we had there when everyone was still allowed into lab. And here's a picture from December, in fact, right before COVID when we were happily um, decorating gingerbread houses for Christmas. And I think we won, didn't we, Beatrice? We won that competition. Our, our gingerbread was the, was the prettiest one. Okay, so thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to take any of your questions. Thank you, Chris, an awesome lecture. Yes, we won. We, we won, we won. <laughs> we won a, a pizza party. Oh that's yes, that's right. right. <laughs> so oh. I'm starting with the questions that were wrote, wrote right in here in the chat. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have some questions. Dr. Bruno Mieto asked some questions, so <laughs> I will start. Uh, he asked, what are the underlying mechanisms related to axonal swelling in M. leprae infected, leprae infected fish? Yeah. Also, do you think that larger axons have bigger mitochondrial profiles to match their metabolic demands? Oh, yeah. So, um, should, I, should I go? Um, should I, can you ask me one and I'll answer it and then we'll go on to the next one? Okay. Is it okay? Okay. So <laughs> just so I don't forget his, que um, his question. So the first one was um, uh, the swelling, the axon swelling. Yeah, that's a great yeah. question. Um, the real answer is I don't know. But what we did see is a correlation between swollen axons and swollen mitochondria. Um, and that happened, um, that was, we saw that both with confocal and then with electron um, microscopy. And so one of the things I'm wondering is, is it, is it possible that the axons swell 
just to give more room to the mitochondria or that the mitochondrial swelling is secondary or that rather the axon swelling is secondary to the mitochondrial swelling. Um, but I don't have any evidence suggesting that, that's just a guess. Um, and then his second question was about the caliber of the axons, right? Uh, also, do you think that the larger axons have bigger mitochondrial profiles to match their metabolic demands? Yes, I, I, that, that makes complete sense that there would be, um, that mitochondria would be critical to supporting um, larger caliber axons, for example, um, uh, in response to um, uh, M. leprae infection. So um, one of the things that we, I was very concerned when I, when I started looking at that data, um, whether there was sort of changes in um, mitochondrial association with axons of different sizes in response to the infection, which I think he's kind of getting at with the, with the question about metabolism. Um, we didn't see, I, I actually went through this very painful process of, um, of um, calculating the distribution of all the different axon sizes across each fish section that we had. And we did not see a change in the caliber of axons. Um, so, um, so that was the only, that's the only data I have that specifically relates to axon caliber. Um, and I, I didn't see a change there, but, um, but that's something that we need to investigate further. Okay. Uh, the other one is still from Bruno. Have you ever, have you seen infected macro, have, sorry. <laughs> Have you seen infected macrophages phagocytizing damage myelin around nerve tracts? Yes. Okay. So he's getting at something that, that Beatrice knows well is, is an interest of mine. Yes. We saw several times. <laughs> okay. So I can't say that we saw the, the, the macrophages phagocytose the bacteria and then phagocytose the myelin. All I can say is that on many instances, we saw macrophages that had both bacteria and myelin inside of them. I don't know which went in first, right? I don't know if the bugs went in first or the myelin went in first, but they both end up in the same macrophage. And I think that's fascinating. Um, I'm really excited about looking more into how, um, and, and I think he, he's getting at this with his question. There's a lot of other researchers that, that have realized that lipid metabolism is probably being manipulated by mycobacteria, right? So they're manipulating host lipid metabolism. Um, and the question is why, right? So one of the things they could be doing is the bacteria themselves could be eating the myelin within the macrophage. Um, and I think we have some good tools in zebrafish to potentially go after that question. Um, there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of really good work to be done there. Um, and and I, I'm happy to collaborate with anybody who's working on that because it's such a cool question and I think could really give us some more information about the interaction between metabolism and the immune response within the nerve. Yeah. Um, now a hard one. What would be the biological advantage for M. leprae to induce nerve damage in the host? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, there's a couple reasons, right? So if you look at the leprosy literature, um, there is this idea out there that potentially the bacteria are going into the nerves to avoid the immune system, right? Um, which certainly could be happening, but in the fish at least, macrophages are quite able to get into nerves. And, and in fact, they even in wild type animals that we haven't infected or touched in any way, you frequently see macrophages patrolling myelinated axons. Um, and so to me, that suggests that, that the immune system is, is quite able to interact with our nervous system. Uh, it, there's not a barrier there really. So of course there is the blood brain barrier and the blood nerve barrier, but at least with macrophages, they seem to be able to bypass this barrier, at least in nerves. Um, so that suggests to me that perhaps hiding out from the immune system may not be the full story. So another explanation for why M. leprae are in nerves is maybe they're just a really good place to get the food that M. leprae wants to eat during infection. So we know that TB um, catabolizes human lipids during infection, right? That's what it lives off of. It, it consumes our lipids. And so that could be happening with M. leprae too inside the nerve. Of course, your nerves are full of fairly readily available fat, right? There's myelin is primarily made out of fat, um, but then there's also other uh, rich sources of fat and axons. So um, I think that's a really fascinating um, hypothesis to pursue. Um, and, and again, I, I'd love to work with anyone on, on these ideas. These are all, Theo Cruz comes up with really, really fascinating and, and good hypotheses in the leprosy field. And I'm, 
um, I'm, I'm happy to learn from them about all of their great research. Just remember that our fish slurry is in the glass tubes to go to the lipidomics. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we, we're ready. We, we have so much, so many lipids from the fish ready to be shot into a mass spec. That's a really exciting experiment. I'm excited for that one. So uh, Dr. Mutan Morais, it's one of our PIs in our lab. In Free yes, Cruise. hello. He will be with Hi, you Kristen, in the Kingston uh, Symposium. So he would ask a question now. Oh, fantastic. Thank you very much, Cressida. It's a very, very nice presentation. A great, um, great model. It's it's uh, very interesting you know, to see all the all the work that you've been doing for the past, let's say, um, how many years now? Five years. Oh yeah, I st I started this project in uh, 2012. Eight uh -oh. years. Wow, it doesn't oh, feel like wow. it's been that yeah. long. <laughs> That's really a lot of work. Yeah, yeah, working with them lepra is not easy, right? I mean, mm -mm, it's, a, no. it's a very difficult task. But anyways, uh, I mean, it's it's amazing also to see that uh, most of our hypotheses are in alignment here, right? I, mean, I know, <laughs> isn't that exciting? Yeah, it is. It is indeed. And uh, I mean, uh, we we've been seeing a lot of uh, uh, of the data, and you, you you mentioned some of some of those, right? I mean, mm -hmm. uh, innate immunity and the yes. uh, uh, the activation of the interferon pathway, yeah. type one interferon pathway, which is which is very nice. Uh, and also the metabolism that we are we were discussing now, right? It's yes. it's very 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 good, and uh, it's and now it's important that we do have a model that we can test it and then inhibit a few genes specific genes because there are so Absolutely. many others that we didn't we didn't uh, uh, understand how they are working, but we are seeing those. And um, in in microarray analysis, RNA seq analysis, and in the in the skin samples, for example, and yeah. uh, and it, it's it's very 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 interesting. Anyways, um, uh, Flavio will probably ask an, another question uh, um, 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 after me, but I will try to um, um, discuss a little bit um, the the viability of the bacteria. Mm -hmm. And uh, and how because and and also the the amount of bacteria that is necessary to actually uh, induce or trigger let's say um, this this kind of response right because yeah. um, it, this is this uh, I mean we 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 see in, at least in our models in vitro with Schumann cells or or either macrophages that depending on the viability and depending on the yes. on, on the dose uh, it's a completely different response. Right. Yeah. So uh, this is the, the kind of a, 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 a point that also could help us to understand a little bit infection and, mm -hmm. and, and exposure, infection and progression towards the disease. Right. So yes. I'd like you to comment a little bit on the bottle if you if you actually sure. tested it. On, on yes. Uh, that. Yeah. So thank you for your questions. Those are all you mentioned all of the things that that I that I worry about all the time uh, in terms of trying to see how um, uh, how good a model this is, right? So, so you pointed out quite rightly that um, you know one of the strengths I think of this I think of this model is basically we find aspects of M. leprae infection in the fish that have correlates in the human disease, and that's how we decide what to study, right? Um, because of course I love fish, but this is really about a human disease, right? It's not necessarily about the fish. It's about what we can learn about humans from this model in fish. So um, let's see, uh, to address the, um, uh, the viability issue. So yeah, this is you know, top of mind for all, all leprae researchers. Um, I have not actually tested uh, unviable mycobacteria leprae in this system. So. Um, we get the bacteria from um, the National Hansen's Disease Program, and I, I always inject it into the fish within two days of it being harvested. Um, I actually almost always do it all on one day because I'm, I'm nervous about it losing viability, right? Um, it's tested for viability before it's shipped to us, but, you know, who knows? Things can happen in shipping, right? Uh, things can be slowed, and then you can lose viability. Um, I... I've never tested it explicitly. Like if we see a different, it would be very easy to do, I imagine, right? I could just um, ask for an aliquot of living um, M. leprae, uh, take half of it sonicated or, or heat treat it to kill it and inject it into the fish and see if we still see this demyelination or not. Um, so that's something I have yet to do. Uh, the other, oh, um, in, the, in the adult animals, 
we don't actually know if they're replicating yet, the bacteria. So what we see is, and, and that was a paper that I didn't really have a lot of time to get into, but what I did is I, I maintained the animals for a year. So I infected them um, with the same amount of bacteria. I, the number actually escapes me right now, but it's, I used the same dose that is given into the mouse foot pad. Um, and I maintained those animals for about a year and I sampled them about every two months. Um, half of the animals went to histology. The other half of the animals, um, uh, as Beatrice knows, are um, going to RNA-seq for like a, a dual host pathogen um, experiment and then also lipidomics, um, hopefully, although uh, we'll have to see how that, the, those first experiments goes because lipidomics can be tricky. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, so I don't know if they're replicating yet in the adults over the full course of that year. Um, we saw that in rag knockout fish, they actually died within six months of infection. Um, that could be due to the M. leprae. It could also be due to some kind of um, lack of immune regulation in fish that don't have, for example, T regs. You can imagine that a rag knockout fish is not going to have T regs, and that if there were some kind of massive inflammatory response that requires T regs to be controlled, that that could potentially be a source of the fish wasting away and dying um, uh, in response to M. leprae. Um, but yeah, viability is is always always a difficult question with M. leprae. Um, uh, but I, um, I can only rely on sort of the tools that we, we have at this point, which are radar respiratory, um, potentially chromosome counting in the adults, and then the um, existing viability assay of comparing um, uh, stable to unstable M. leprae transcript to get that ratio, right? That's right um, yeah. The other thing that could potentially help um, is use of the marina model, right? So because we can put genes in um, and then also knock them out of marinum. We could con we could um, construct a bunch of different recombinant strains of marinum that, for example, um, lack many of the virulence factors that we know are no longer produced in M. leprae, but also have um, large portions of the M. leprae genome. So that's a potentially another approach that we can use to get at this viability question. Great. Um, I. I about the dose, uh, did you, I mean, infection, uh, according to, um, you know, if you, if you use a thousand um, right. um, MOI or a ten or one, is that different? And, and just, just another quick question, uh, have you ever tried um, emophilum, mycobacterium emophilum or any other, because it's, it's very interesting that in the past, uh, let's say five years or so, uh, we are sequencing and isolating new mycobacteria that oh, are yeah. not growing, yeah, and, and, and like M. oberis and M. lepromatosis, obviously. Yes, yes, lepromatosis. Far, yeah, those are far difficult to, I mean, even isolate because we didn't have um, that viable um, skin um, biopsy uh, to actually inject in a, in a mouse foot bed or so and, and actually and then grow it but anyways uh, emophilum for example it's 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 a little bit I, I don't know I mean that would be interesting to compare yeah. marinum and, and, and emophilum and see uh, whether that would be a, a, an interesting a model as well to test yeah and in fact like along those lines there's there's um actually a couple different mycobacterial species that can cause nerve injury, right? So one is leprosy, the other is lepromatosis. Um, and then the other one is ulcerins, mycobacterium ulcerins. And, yeah. and um, intriguingly, a lipid is also at the center of that potential um, neuropathogenesis story. And so that's, it's just one more intriguing um, intriguing breadcrumb about how important lipids are to mycobacteria potentially even mycobacteria that are causing neurological infections. Um, so yeah, everything you've talked about are things that I'm interested in. Um, we, right. uh, if my other grad students here were here, they'd tell you about all the different clinical isolates we've been pumping into these fish, um, looking for different neurological phenotypes. Many of we, so we're uh, many of those clinical isolates cause disease in in the fish that looks a lot like human infection. Um, for these various different neurological infections. And so, so far the fish model, at least for understanding neurological infection really seems to be, um, it, it seems like a great model so far. Um, I, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm 
every day I'm amazed at how closely the human or the zebrafish data tracks with the human data. Um, it's, it's really been above and beyond my expectations for an animal model. Um, I'm, I'm pleased with it. And then of course, one of the things I'm, I'm really interested in doing with field crews is connecting our fish data back to what's seen in humans, right? Looking at human nerve biopsies, human skin biopsies, and really making sure that um, everything that we find in fish and that we report in fish with this infection is really well supported um, by the clinical data. Thank you, thank you very much, Cressida. It's uh, it's well. Let's let's do it. It's uh, obviously yeah. I'm excited. Uh, let's do, let's <laughs> do all the cool science. Let's do it. Of course, <laughs> great. I will I will let you uh, answer other questions. Uh, thank you again. Great. Thank you. <laughs> so we have another question from. I don't know if I'm going to speak it correctly, but Ihne Prado or Arne Prado, do you think that other Atypical mycobacteria, such as Mycobacterium marinum or other, can contribute to the to permanence and progression of the disease caused by Mycobacterium leprae. So, do I think that um, marinum could exacerbate the disease caused by M. leprae? Is that the question? To the, yeah, to the permanence and progression of in I think it's just in in association, right? And marinum or any other. Uh, uh, atypical mi mycobacteria? Well, um, it's a good question. So I, I think the thing I would look to for that is what do we see with people who have been BCG vaccinated in their course um, of leprosy infection? And so this is, this is a, a clinical question, which maybe I would turn to um, a physician who knows more than me to answer. Um, but my understanding, so if, if we're going to ask the question, do other forms of mycobacteria contribute to progression of an M. leprae infection? I would, my, my first, my gut instinct would be to think about how that other mycobacterial infection is modifying the immune system um, and how that modification of the immune system might then contribute to um, immunopathogenesis and leprosy. So if that to, to determine if that's happening, the first thing I would look to would be the literature on BCG vaccination and the course of M. leprae. So my understanding is that leprosy patients are not protected from M. leprae infection if they have gotten the BCG vaccination and there's no protection offered by that vaccination. So to me, that suggests that there's enough of a difference between the immune response to M. leprae and the immune response to potentially other mycobacteria that cause infections in humans like BCG um, or, or potentially tuberculosis, um, that there's not enough overlap uh, potentially to cause um, uh, the immune system that's been activated by BCG to then um, uh, be able to recognize and eliminate M. leprae. That's my understanding of the human data. But if somebody who's listening has a, has a better understanding, please chime in and, and correct me. Um, but that's what I would think. Okay, our next question will be held uh, from Dr. Flavio Lara. He is the PI of the oh, yeah, yeah. Cellular, cellular mm -hmm. Microbi Microbiology Lab on the yes. second floor. Yes. So Flavio, do you want to write or do you want to open your microphone? Uh, well, I, I, I can make the question directly. Uh, are you listening? Yes. Yeah. Uh, hi, thank you, Chrisida, for the very nice presentation. Beautiful data, beautiful video. Hi, Flavio. <laughs> uh, a long time ago that we, we discussed. I know, yes. <laughs> yeah. So thank you so much for this presentation. And I was curious about your data of uh, knockout, uh, macrophage knockout fishes. I think mm -hmm. that's... Is the PU or P1 gene? I don't know. Yes. Uh -huh. There is no macrophage in there. And you see that the milipri is, uh, uh, is growing inside the, the fish. Is it correct? Uh, no. So, yeah. So, um, in the lepri, uh, or excuse me, in the larvae, we only have about a week to work with them before they are too big to to do all of our fancy genetics and imaging on. So we, we don't assume that the, the M. leprae are replicating in the larvae 
because of course the M. leprae replication time is um, you know 12 to 14 days, at least in mouse. So when I started working with the larvae um, with this infection, I sort of realized that there was not going to be, I, I wasn't going to be able to assess replication. I was only going to be able to assess clearance. So I think the, um, the slide you're referring to, let me, um, I, I can actually bring it up right here real quick, um, is based on bacterial fluorescence. Yeah. Yeah, so what we see is that there is more fluorescent bacteria maintained in the fish. Here we go, this is the slide, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay, right, so what we see is that there's more bacterial fluorescence in the fish that lack macrophages compared to wild type animals. We don't know if that's, I would assume that is not due to replication. I would assume that what that is due to is that the macrophages in the wild type animals are simply consuming and destroying the bacteria at a faster rate than in the, macro, in the fish that lack macrophages. So I think that this difference in fluorescence is simply due to death occurring faster, the death of the M. leprae occurring faster in the wild type animals than in the um, macrophage depleted animals. Okay, this fluorescence is, is peaky, peaky age? Yes, yes. Okay. Okay, okay. Uh, I, I, I was wondering about replication and I was wondering yeah, yeah. if the cells are replicating outside macrophage and-, and Yeah, I, 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 have no, I have no evidence for that. I would, I would love to have evidence for that, but I don't have evidence for that in the fish. Um, but you know, that is an experiment that, so what we would need to do that experiment is um, fish that I can work with for longer than a week. And so we actually have that now. So we built a, um, a BL2 fish facility um, attached to my lab where we can infect adult animals and maintain them for two years if we want um, uh. in, in separate tanks. Um, and then all of the water from, we, we had Aquaneering build us this system where all of the overflow water from those tanks goes into bleach and is bleach treated before we send it down the drain. Um, so, so we're able to keep everyone safe while maintaining these like long-term infected zebrafish. Um, so there, that is a situation where I think we can look at replication and ask if it's happening. Um, yeah. In the larvae, I don't think we have enough time to work with the larvae to see that doubling. Producing milipri in fish will be for sure pretty much easier and cheaper than producing in nude mice. Well, I know. So, so actually, when I started this project, David Scollard um, contacted me and was like, do you think this we could use this to, to generate lepri?" easier than, than, than it is in, in, in mouse. And my answer to that is, well, if it's replicating, then yes, it would be much easier, I think, because, you know, you can fit, um, you know, a fish tank is about this big, right? And you can, you know, it, maybe this big, if you were doing a large tank and you can, you can fit a hundred fish in there and each one can be, you know, an incubator for M. leprae for you. So um, that would be, that would be awesome. Um, and I would love to do that because then I wouldn't have to get my leprae from Louisiana anymore. <laughs> yeah. um, but the first step to that is showing that they're replicating. And then also we, I, I'm, I'm hopeful that we can optimize that, right? Because the, it's so easy to do genetics in fish. Um, for example, if we see that they replicate in the rag knockout fish, then what we can do is just generate thousands of rag knockout zebrafish and maintain them all you know, infected for however many months we optimize the, the replication point to, and then sack them all at once. Um, so yeah, those are things that I'm, I would very much like to, um, to look at in the future, definitely. Yeah, this, this is very exciting. And for sure, it will be very nice to, to check uh, RNA of these emilipri from fish. Then yes, absolutely. Then yeah, so I, I would love to look at... Um, both in terms of the host response and the bacterial response, I'd love to be able to compare those data to the great data that you all already have from, um, from humans, either blood draws or biopsies or Schwann cell culture. Um, it would be really interesting to look at the differences between both the fish response or the host response and the bacterial response. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. And uh, congratulations for uh, your very nice work.
Oh, well, thank you, Flavio. I, I, it, it's not, this work would not be possible without you because your lab is the one that found the mitochondrial defects, right? In the le human leprosy patients. And that was the paper while I was working on this, when that paper came out in 2016, that was the thing that, that let me know that maybe what I was seeing in the fish was relevant to humans. Yeah, thank you. So the next question is from Andrea. Kipnis? Kipnis? My question is about infection dose. What is oh, the infection yes. dose for an animal? And is there a difference in disease progression as different, infection, different infecting doses are used? Oh. Is yes, there a so, difference between infection and dose? So the, um, the dose we use is different when we infect adults versus when we infect larvae. When we infect adults, um, I believe, and I'd have to double, it's a, a Journal of Infectious Diseases paper. I'd have to double check the methods to make sure I'm giving you the right number, um, but it's published there in the methods. I believe it's 10 to the seven yeah, is how many bacteria we injected the adults with. Um, and then when we do these infections in larvae, um, we do, I think it's 10 to the three per animal in the larvae. So for example, in the slide that you can see right now, this animal on top and, and the one on bottom were injected with 10 to the three bacteria. And that's a caudal vein injection. So we, we inject into the circulation of the larvae. When we inject into adults, we're injecting into the interperitoneal cavity. Um, and that's where all the granulomas form. And they actually, um, they specifically seem to form in the adipose tissue of the fish, um, which again is, uh, fascinating potentially um, as it relates to lipid metabolism. Um, so yeah, so those are the doses. We, we can modify the doses um, um, depending on what kind of experiment we're doing. Um, but if we go too low, like if we give too few bacteria, the fish just completely clear it. So, we, so um, uh, for that reason, um, I tend to give a, a higher dose to look at some of these interactions, right? Granuloma formation, um, recruitment of macrophages, innate immune responses. Um, in the nerves though, when we do our um, myelinated axon infections, there the dose is much lower. It's maybe a hundred bacteria. Mm -hmm. Wait, you, you also did the group A with one bacteria, 10, 100, then two, four, then two, five, then Yes, it yes, we, we did do a dose curve. Yeah, we did a dose curve. Mm -hmm. So, um, oh my God, I missed one question. Lawrence Albuquerque asked, can we say there is no examination of M. leper without macrophages? There's no what of, of M. leprae? Uh, if there is no examination of the M. leprae without the macrophages. Oh, if uh, the macrophages are necessary to spread the infection. Oh, oh, uh, so so he um, this person wants to know about what's the role of the macrophage in in disseminating M. leprae yeah. throughout the animal. Okay, so um, that's another area that um, I've sort of published a little bit of data on, but haven't returned to yet. But yes, that is that is what these data would suggest because in in zebrafish we're able to actually look at the location of every single bacterium inside the fish right and we do that either by confocal which is what this image is of or this is just simple um, fluorescence microscopy the same way that you would do it with cell culture for example because remember the larvae are very small they're they're about a millimeter um, so in these animals um, we're able to see where all the bacteria are and you can see that in this wild type animal compared to a macrophage depleted fish, the bacteria really stay where you inject them in the macrophage depleted fish. They, they do distribute throughout the animal a bit um, based on circulation. Um, but if you are to look more specifically by confocal, for example, of where the bacteria go, only when there are monocytes or, or myeloid derived cells, only when those cells are present in the fish, do we see um, the bacteria escaping from the circulation. So for example, this cell has left the circulation and this one is in sort of in progress of leaving circulation, right? And that only happens when there's myeloid cells around. What I have not shown, so this is just looking at circulation, right? I haven't shown where the bacteria go after they leave circulation, right? So you, you might expect that 
this would be a way for the bacteria to get into nerves, right? Is they, their first presence in circulation, they're taken up by monocytes, which we know happens in people, and then the monocytes leave circulation and go into a nerve. I never actually um, tried to observe that event. Um, it may be something that we would like to look at in the future though, because I think it's a really interesting question. How do the bacteria get into the nerves in the first place? But yeah, we think that that will require macrophages. Now we have a question from an immunologist, Dr. Hannah Prata. Uh -huh. Do you think this phagocytic myelin can favor the death of the macrophage, thus increasing the damage and local inflammation? Yeah, so that's that's actually a really fascinating question. So um, we know that um, when an axon undergoes degeneration, it produces myelin and axon debris that must be cleared out or the axon can't regrow. And so there's a, there's a very strong physiological need for macrophages to remove that debris during a nerve infection, right? Or, or nerve injury. Um, when macrophages consume myelin or axonal debris, that actually stimulates them to be shifted towards um, what they refer to as an M2 phenotype, right? So this is a more, this is a phenotype of macrophages that's associated with repair, um, inhibiting inflammation, um, increased phagocytosis, of course, because the macrophages are trying to repair, you know, some kind of a tissue injury. And um, it's also associated with increased production of TGF beta and interferon beta. Um, and so there seems to be this shift in macrophages that have consumed myelin. And yeah, wouldn't that be convenient for the mycobacteria inside that macrophage, right? At first they were inside a macrophage that was trying to kill them, right? With antimicrobial peptides, for example, TNF, interferon gamma. And then once that macrophage consumes the myelin, now there's this phenotypic shift, right? Towards a phenotype that is less able to kill the bacteria and that potentially provides a better environment for them to replicate in. So I think this issue of um, understanding how the immune system is interacting with the nervous system during infection, I think that's gonna be extremely relevant to understanding leprosy neuropathy because of course your immune system and your ner nervous system are talking to each other constantly. Um, and the signals that they give each other probably have um, quite a significant impact on host pathogen interactions during leprosy. Right. So another question from Dr. Bruno Nieto. What about axon integrity? Have you seen axonal degeneration and or demise in your fish model? If not, any reason for that? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. And that's actually one of the things that we were about to get started when COVID hit was looking at Wallerian degeneration of axons, right? So um, one of the things that could happen in an axon that has mitochondrial injury is that that axon could degenerate. Now, there is some evidence from the multiple sclerosis field that um, it's probably reversible, right? So an axon with mitochondrial injury, either due, you know, due to nitric oxide or some other insult, um, that axon probably doesn't always die. It probably can recover in some, in some circumstances. But of course, if you've lost, if the axon does degenerate, now it needs to regrow. And I'm really interested to know why that doesn't happen efficiently in leprosy patients, right? If you have a nerve injury that results from demyelination, that can be repaired. Um, it's repaired in Guillain-Barre syndrome. It's repaired in, in multiple sclerosis, although there is, it, it does, there is this back and forth, right? If you get these recurrent um, episodes. Um, but myelination generally can be repaired um, if it's lost. So does that happen in leprosy? If not, why? Um, yeah, those are great questions. And, and I very much wanna, um, wanna pursue that because there's fantastic neuroscience tools in zebrafish for looking at Wallerian degeneration um, we can actually block it in the fish um, using the same approach that people use in mouse by expressing this um, WLDS protein in neurons. So one of the things we could look at first is, is there axon degeneration? If yes, how does it happen? But then secondly, if we block the axon degeneration, how does that impact the outcome of infection, right? Um, is, that, is the presence of axonal debris subsequent to Wallerian degeneration, does that provide another immunological clue um, that allows M. leprae to grow especially well in a nerve, 
for example. Uh, and what about astrocytes function in your model? Do they get infected and possible role in contributing or protecting the nerve tract from damage? Yeah, so, um, so um, astrocytes are um, a little bit different in zebrafish larvae from mammals. So in the larvae, they have um, uh, cells that express astrocyte markers like GFAP. Uh, but they don't have the morphology yet of a mature astrocyte, that nice star appearance, right? Those, those more typical astrocytes um, are only present in adult zebrafish. So I, I don't have any findings with astrocytes for this work. Um, I think if we want to do those experiments, then we either need to do them in adult animals that have this more typical astrocyte morphology, or potentially do them in um, another, um, this other fish model that um, a friend of mine and I are, are working on developing um, where you can do imaging of, um, of things like astrocytes in adult fish um, in the same way that we would do them in larvae. So yeah, I think we would need to tweak the model to look at the impact on astrocytes. Great, let, let, let me just check. Working on oh my God. Sorry, if we have more questions on YouTube. Uh, okay, that's all. So, Presta, a lot of people uh, congratulating you on the chat. Thank you very much for the excellent presentation. Thank you, Dr. Madigan, excellent data, quality, and presentation. Congratulations, congratulations for a great start. Oh my God, congratulations for a great start for the international course. Uh, and congratulations on an excellent presentation, excellent presentation and discussion. Congratulations, Roberta Owen, everyone involved. With You're making my cheeks red. I'm getting embarrassed now. <laughs> in the international course. And yeah, guys, she's a very nice person, an awesome advisor and manager. I can <laughs> guarantee that. <laughs> so uh, I think that's all for today. Uh, Roberta, are you here? I think you just disappeared from my participants list here. Okay, I'm here, okay. but my internet's not okay. good today. Okay. <laughs> Can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. It was a very nice presentation. Thank you for the excellent discussions. Thank you very much, Cresta. I don't know if, if Ana Paula would like to speak. Hi, Cresta. Thank you very much. I was very happy to hear about your work on your own voice because I read your papers and I am always fascinated for your uh, results. And today I am very glad that I finally meet you. Thank you very much for this presentation. And I think that all the students are very happy now that this was a very good start for our, our course, I think. That we did a great um, choice that you could come on the first day because it was a brilliant presentation. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, this work is really, um, uh, comes out of um, everyone working together in my lab. It's, a very, it's very much a team environment. There's lots of, lots of labs involved. Um, and uh, just so everyone knows, I'm, I'm happy and excited for collaborations in the future. Uh, leprosy is, is a, a, a real passion of mine. And I, I'm very excited to share any aspects of the data or the model with anyone who's interested. Um, I think zebrafish can do a lot for microbiology. There's really, there's really a lot of work to do using the zebrafish to understand some of these early events and host pathogen interactions that I always wondered about and I just could never see happening in a mouse, right? Because they're not transparent. <laughs> and then now that we have, now that we have the fish, there's, there's so many projects um, getting off the ground right now um, using zebrafish and microbiology. So I would really encourage anyone who's interested in host pathogen interactions to consider how, how a fish model might be able to help you. Um, but yeah, uh, and, and, but of course it's always very important to connect back to the human data. And so this was a really great talk, um, a great environment for me to give this talk in because I get so much great feedback from, uh, people who see the human face of leprosy all the time. Right. Um, so thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you. 
All right. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> bye bye. Bye. <laughs>